Thank you so much for watching. I'm Dr. Childs, and today I want to talk to you about how to lose weight after a thyroidectomy and specifically focus in on some of the things that your doctor is probably missing. All right? And the reason we even have to discuss this is because it's almost considered normal for patients to gain 20 to 30 pounds after they have their thyroid removed. Meanwhile, that may happen with you, and then your doctor is saying in the same breath or the very next sentence, by the way, the thyroid isn't involved with weight at all. And that doesn't really make a lot of sense, um, especially when you gain weight after you had it removed and you haven't changed anything else in terms of diet or exercise or anything like that. So what we're going to do is talk about the things that are within your control, um, all of the changes that you might be able to make to influence your weight, uh, and how to approach weight loss in this kind of special patient population. Um, and what I mean by that is patients who don't have um, a thyroid. And this, by the way, could be from either uh, thyroidectomy because it's removed or post-radioactive iodine ablation, okay? So in e either scenario, this, this is true. And some of this is true also if you just have hypothyroidism, like, for instance, some patients who have prolonged Hashimoto's are, are essentially functioning with, with very little um, thyroid tissue anyway, so they can kind of fall into this category as well. So basically, the, the question I want to start with here is why do patients gain weight after a thyroidectomy? Um, well, the, the, the reason for this is is multifaceted, obviously, but one of the main things is the thyroid helps control the metabolism. Now, it isn't the only thing in your body that controls the metabolism, but it certainly is involved in this process. And, and what I have here is um, a, a study that shows that weight changes in new thyroid patients after they've, after they've had a thyroidectomy. So basically what it's saying is these were patients who had, I believe in the study, they were patients that had cancer, but had a functioning thyroid, and then they said, okay, you know, like let's, everything aside from the fact that these patients had cancer, um, their thyroid was functioning normal, they take out the thyroid, then they see what happens. And a bunch of them gained weight afterwards. And so they were like, okay, well, that's, that's kind of interesting. So obviously there's some issue between the way that we approach the care um, postoperatively and um, the way that the thyroid is function, functioning naturally. So we're going to try and bridge that gap here. Now, the, the main thing here I want to point out is weight gain is not... Um, mediated by calories or exercise, okay? And, and it doesn't make any sense because if, if, it were, if that were the case, then patients would be able to simply cut their calories and, and exercise more after their thyroidectomy and they'd be able to lose the weight. And furthermore, that doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense because um, we have multiple studies showing that as hormones change in the body, patients can gain weight or lose weight. And so one of the basic understandings of this is uh, the example of menopause, right? So what they, we, we know, science knows that women, and this is a study showing it, women gain, I think, 10 to 15 pounds in menopause, and that is without changing anything in their diet. It's without changing any, any amount of exercise they do. So is, is it just magical that they gain weight during this time? Probably not. Another example, this is the post-thyroidectomy type of situation, right? So you have patients who are eating the same and exercising the same. They get their thyroid taken out, and then boom, 20 pounds, they, they put on, pack on 20 pounds like it's nothing. So obviously the answer is more complex than just eat less and exercise more. And so that's exactly what we're going to talk about here. So um, one of the questions I get a lot is, uh, or one of, the, one of the comments I should say I get a lot about uh, any thyroid patient who is trying to lose weight is that they tend to obsess about diet. And, and again, it kind of comes back to that, that whole thing that I mentioned previously. They sort of wrongly believe that diet is going to be, solve everything. And, and that's just not the case. It, there are certain situations and certain hormone imbalances that cannot be affected um, drastically with diet. So in other words, the hormone imbalances that are in place in your body need to be influenced in some other way aside from just the diet. Now having said that, diet, especially after thyroidectomy, is very important. Why? Well, here's the deal with thyroidectomy patients, and this is true of, of any patient who has had a, a um, endocrine gland taken out of their body. Now science has never been good at doing the same function that the body does naturally, okay? What I mean by that is, let's take for instance type 1 diabetics. So type 1 diabetics, they essentially have, well the pancreas does, does several things, but one of the main things in a type 1 diabetic is the fact that it doesn't have regulation of insulin, okay? And so what we do is they say, oh okay, no problem, we'll just give patients who have type 1 diabetics insulin, and then their blood sugars will be controlled. Well ask any type 1 diabetic how that's going for them, and you'll, you'll soon find out that our version of control is nowhere near what, nowhere near as close to what somebody who had a functioning pancreas would be. Now, extract that data and compare that to the thyroid. The same thing is true. 
Okay, so even though it seems simple enough to just say, okay, well, the thyroid produces 100 micrograms of T4 and 80 micrograms of T3, and so let's just give every person that gets their thyroid out that amount of thyroid, and everyone should be fine, right? It, it's not that simple. There's, there's conversion issues. There's re cellular resistance. There's probably a bunch of other factors that we don't even know about that exist that are influencing this whole thing. Now, the, the point that I'm trying to make here is if you've had your thyroid taken out, you're in a very special category. Now, you just are going to have to, at least for now, now this may change, but at least for now, you're going to have to accept that we, science, is not going to be able to completely uh, fix your thyroid in, in, to the extent that it was, to, to make it function like it was when you had a, a, a normal thyroid. So that means you're going to have to be very, um, very in tune with your diet and some of the things that are within your control. So you might say, well, I've got friends who, you know, they can eat an occasional cake and things like that. That, that probably doesn't apply to you simply because we don't have the same control that they do over their thyroid, okay? Now, having said that, I put up a bunch of, I put up a, a bunch of information here that you can look at. So what kind of protein you want to be eating, what kind of fat that's, that's healthy that you want to be eating, what type of veggies are healthy, what type of fruit. And then in addition, I gave you some, por some portion sizes. So feel free to look at this on the side, kind of go over it. Whatever you think that you need is totally fine with me. But all this information is there for you. And so you can go to this webpage and I'll have it posted in the description below so you, can, you guys can kind of get to that. So I just want to provide the diet because everyone focuses on that. Um, but here, here's where the real money is. Now these are, these are some weight loss tips after thyroidectomy that um, I have used in patients in my practice and I've used them successfully. So it is not a lost cause. I mean, it is possible for you to lose weight. Don't, don't think that it isn't. But you're probably going to have to take this into your own hands, okay? So let's jump into that right away. So number one, of course, is get on the right type and dose of thyroid medication, all right? So just a brief primer for, for those that don't know. Um, the standard of care after a thyroidectomy is to put somebody on levothyroxine, um, which is a T4-containing medication only, all right? Now, if that's mumbo-jumbo to you, don't worry. I'll just explain briefly what it is. So T4, which is what levothyroxine, synthroid, levoxyl, tyrosine, all of those things, that, that's kind of the class of medications that they fall into, and T4 is the inactive thyroid hormone, okay? Yes, I said it's inactive. Now, in order for it to be activated in the body, it needs to be converted to um, a thyroid hormone called T3, okay? Now, T3 is the active thyroid hormone. Now, we all, medicine and, and science and doctors and physicians, there, there is a medicine that is, contains pure T3, but it's rarely ever used because it's felt to be kind of strong and erratic and a number of other things, right? So... But that doesn't mean you don't need it. I'm just telling you what the standard of care is. The standard of care is to give somebody T4 post-thyroidectomy and just base that off their TSH and say, okay, well, you know, the body's probably converting the T4 to T3 naturally, so everything's fine, right? Well, that isn't always true. Um, a number of factors kind of affect that, and I've included a study here that showed that um, patients who were on level thyroxine versus those that were on natural desiccated thyroid, and those that were on the NDT had more weight loss, they felt a lot better, uh, anyway, they just had to improve, reduce symptoms of depression, et cetera. You can read through that study if you'd like, but that's kind of it in a nutshell. So obviously, there's a subgroup of patients who do significantly better with a little bit of T3. And I probably should have mentioned that natural desiccated thyroid is more of a combination of T4 and T3 into, into the medication, like kind of naturally. So as opposed to taking level thyroxine, which is 100% T4, NDT is something like almost about, uh, this isn't the exact ratio, but it's about 80-20 or so. Um, 80% T4, about 20% T3. Um, pretty close to that anyway. So uh, anyway, what, what I'm trying to say here is there's studies showing that many patients do better when they have some addition of T3 in the system. Okay, so you can, you can read more about that here, but um, what I want to say is for most patients, especially post-thyroidectomy, who are still having symptoms of hypo, hypothyroidism, for instance, maybe your hair is still falling out, you have insane fatigue, your extremities are cold, your eyebrows you know, are falling out, skin's dry, you have constipation, etc., and your doctor keeps telling you, hey, you're on T4 and everything's fine, eh, probably not, okay? And though that's a patient, that's a, sub, a subgroup of the population that probably will do a lot better on natural desiccated thyroid, which is that 80-20 ratio of T4 to T3. Or the other option is you can simply add T3, which is a medication called lyothyronine or cytomel, to your total T4 dose. Now, in the patients that I treat, I generally will try to get them up to about an 80-20 ratio of T4 to T3, unless they also have some sort of chronic... Um, inflammatory disease, they have chronic diseases like insulin resistance, leptin resistance, um, low-grade infections, things like that. If they're, basically, the more sick you are, probably the more T3 that you would benefit from, okay? 
So, but if let's say that you were on 100 micrograms of T4 level thyroxine, still feeling, you know, like crap, and you're wondering where, where a good place to start was, well, just try and mim mimic the 80-20 ratio that your body produces naturally. So that would be the, just simply add about 20 micro or so of T3 to your total T4 dose. Now, don't do this on your own, obviously. You need to find a doctor that's willing to work with you because the addition of T3 can be dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. And that's part of the reason why I think a lot of doctors tend to shy away from it because you can get more symptoms with it. So I think that's just them kind of covering their butts, so to speak. So number, that's number one, you got to get on the right thyroid medication. Um, it won't lead to significant weight loss, although it might help with the first five to, five to 10 to 15 pounds or so. Um, the second thing is you really want to make sure you're optimizing your free T3 levels. Now, this is something that you can do on your own. Um, obviously, it's more difficult to convince your doctor to give you T3 medication because you can't control him, but you can control some of the things on how to optimize your free T3 levels. And you might say, well, why do, why am I, why do I want to do that? Well, I just mentioned before that T3 is the most, well, it is, it's the active form of thyroid hormone. So you want as much as possible, as much free T3 as possible floating around in your blood. All right. Now there are some things that you can do to increase that. So, and I've, I've given you a list here. So number one is you can take some supplements that actually help the T4 to T3 conversion. Now I didn't include this uh, um, in here. There's a graph that shows there's about, I want to say 13 or, or more nutrients involved in the production, the conversion and the cellular sensitivity of thyroid hormone throughout its life. So many of these, many patients are actually deficient. And so, for example, one of the three, well, I think there's, yeah, three of the supplements that help actually the T4 to T3 conversion, which you want in the body, include zinc, selenium, and B6. Now, generally, what I find in a lot of patients is most of them are zinc deficient, for sure, and B6 deficient, with a good number being selenium deficient as well. So if you haven't already, consider taking these supplements. Now, don't, don't do the uh, spray and pray approach, which is, to just take a ton of supplements and hope that it's working. That, that's going to cause a lot of issues. So don't do that. Try and specifically target the, the nutrients to what your body is deficient in. Okay. Um, the second thing you can do is get off medications, if possible, that block T4 to T3 conversion. So a list of these medications, and I, I don't want you to just yank yourself off of these, but you can start the processes to see, well, is this something that I can get off of? So for instance, antidepressants. Obviously, you do not want to just take yourself off antidepressants if you're on them. You'll have really bad withdrawal. Okay, narcotics being another one, narcotics, pain, pain medications, etc., can blunt that response. Mood stabilizers, that would be things for like bipolar disorder. Um, occasionally, I will see patients with really, really bad depression and anxiety on some of these things. Um, any pain, sort of pain modulators, and what I mean by that is things like gabapentin, Lyrica, Neurontin, things like those that modulate the, the brain's receptors to pain. Um, blood pressure medications and diabetic medications, those are two really big ones. So you might say, well, my blood pressure is high. How could I get off of it? Or I'm, I'm a diabetic. How could I possibly get off my medications? Well, if you, if you use the right approach, you, and you can actually reverse some of these, some of these conditions and, and help get yourself off medications. Um, you just have to take that right approach. Now, um, I, I, again, you, you are going to need some help potentially getting off medications. So don't just go yanking yourself off of these things. But I do want to just inform you that some of these things ha are known to kind of blunt that T4 to T3 conversion. And so if you're out there saying, well, I'm going to take some supplements, meanwhile, you're taking those medications listed above, it's probably counter out, counter counteracting the, the, uh, the benefit, right? Um, one of the, the next things is you want to make sure your digestive tract is um, on par. And so what I mean by that is make sure you don't have anything like acid reflux, bloating, irritable bowel syndrome, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, small intestinal fungal overgrowth, anything like that. So you want to make sure that your GI tract is is kind of up to par and you're not dealing with any issues there, okay? Um, the next thing is you want to make sure your iron levels are in the optimal range. And iron is a Goldilocks type of thing, type of molecule here. And, um, so you want to make sure that it's not too low and it's not too high. And you, I've, again, I've linked you here to an entire article on how to figure out that, figure out where your iron needs to be and how to replace it. Now, one of the tricky parts about being hypothyroid is it tends to actually uh, cause a malabsorption of iron. So the, the less thyroid hormone you have in your body, the less iron you have, which makes iron worse. So it's kind of this vicious cycle. So iron is definitely one of the big ones in addition to those supplements I mentioned above. And then of course, make sure that you're reducing any inflammation in the body if present. And this is, this is kind of an easy one, but really what you need to be doing is checking for CS or CRP and ESR in the body and just see if the body is reacting to anything. And what you'll often find is that if you have conditions like insulin resistance, if you have leptin resistance, if you have any of these things, those are going to alter the, the uh, markers in your body and you'll see them. So if they're elevated, your ESR is greater than 
I use 10 as a cutoff, but I believe the actual range is 20, but 10 I feel is a more sensitive cutoff. And CRP, it just depends on, on the, uh, what you're looking at, but generally greater than one is an issue. So look at those things, and if they're high, you know you've got a problem, okay? So basically, the bottom line he here is more free T3 equals higher metabolism equals more weight loss for this, this uh, patient population. Now, that doesn't mean you just want to be on T3 only. That's a whole other story for post-thyroidectomy patients. But for now, just remember that it, it is advantageous for you to have more T3 in the body. Okay, so that's number one and number two. Number three, we want to make sure we're balancing all hormonal systems in the body. Okay, so what do I mean by that? I'm going to give you a huge list here. I, I talk about this, you know, ad nauseum on my blog. I mean, I, I, I'm always mentioning these things. And in my opinion, this probably is the single most important thing that you can do if you have, if you're post-thyroidectomy and looking for, for weight loss issues. Now, unfortunately, this also will require a knowledgeable physician to help you with this. But I've kind of tried to make this as foolproof as possible with providing you all the information necessary to ask for the right test, to pursue treatment, etc. So let's just go over these briefly. Um, so the hormones I'm specifically talking about, insulin, um, number one, and I probably put leptin as number two, even though I know I'm not, they're not in that order. But insulin um, would be things like, well, on the spectrum of insulin resistance is diabetes and prediabetes. So, or, so if you're having issues with your blood sugar, now you may not know what is insulin resistance, but what you probably would know is your doctor said, hey, your blood sugar is a little high. Okay, that's an indication that, you're in, that you have high levels of insulin or insulin resistance. Okay, we'll go over how to test for that. Estrogen levels, obviously high estrogen in a woman can lead to weight gain in the hips, butt, thighs area. Um, low testosterone can cause weight gain, especially in kind of the upper arms area, different distributions on the body. Leptin, body increase in body fat all over the place, especially with high levels of leptin. And then of cortisol, of course, causes tends to be predominantly belly fat type of um, uh, weight gain. Um, and, and that's with insulin too. Insulin is more of like a, the belly sort of area. So what I've done here is I've, I've shown you how to test for each of these things. Um, it's very comprehensive. shows you the test that you need to ask, that you need to look for or ask for, and then how to interpret the ranges. And this, if it looks complex, it, it, it is a little complex. It's not, after you read through it several times, it'll probably make more and more sense, but it's not exactly, it's not exactly uh, medicine 101 is what I would say. So if you're having issues with your current provider who maybe isn't willing to work with you or isn't willing to order these tests, I would just probably look for somebody who is. So again, I just want to focus real quick on the two most common that are, that are most likely to be affecting you in terms of um, weight gain, and that's insulin and leptin resistance. So in order to check for that, you want to order a fasting insulin. Okay, I use eight to 12 hours is fine. Fasting insulin, and I would also get a hemoglobin A1C, and there's some other things here, but focus on those two. Your fasting insulin should be less than five. Your hemoglobin A1C should also be less than five. Those are sort of the ranges that I use. Now, if it's higher than that, or if you're pre-diabetic, or if you're diabetic, you have insulin resistance, period. And until proven otherwise, that's probably causing more of your weight issues than your thyroid is, okay? You're, even if it's out and you're taking medication, it's probably still more related to the insulin. Then the next one is leptin resistance. This one's probably the easiest of all the hormones. All you have to do is order a fasting serum leptin level. And that should be less than, I use 10 to 12. Um, basically, you should not have any leptin, any, any high levels of leptin in the fasted state. If you do, that's an indication of leptin resistance. And again, if you have leptin resistance, um, generally they go together, insulin and leptin resistance. So if you have one, you probably have the other. Occasionally, I will find someone who, who has insulin resistance without leptin resistance, but I've never seen somebody who has leptin resistance who doesn't also have insulin resistance. So just pay attention to that. And again, if either of these or both of these are present, that until proven otherwise is the issue with your weight, okay? They have to be treated. And I have different videos um, on how to do that. I have different blog posts on how to do that. So just look for one of those um, those videos to show you how to do the treatment. But it's important for, the, for what we're talking about today to just know if it's present or not, okay? Um, that's number three. Number four is I want you to be strict with your diet but don't restrict calories. So one of the one of the, the biggest problems I see in, in post-thyroidectomy patients is, and I don't blame them, I think it's probably a reflection of the endocrinologist and whoever is treating them, but they they it's drilled into their head that they need to eat less and exercise more. So it's not uncommon for me to see post-thyroidectomy patients eating 900, 1,000 to 1,200 calories per day just naturally. Like that, That's just where they live every single day. And if they had so much as have a little bit more, they immediately start packing on the pounds. So they're kind of like, okay, well, if I just eat less, I just stay hungry all the time, then I won't gain weight. And so that's been kind of the mentality of many post-thyroidectomy patients that I, that I deal with. Now, that's a recipe for disaster because that calorie, constant chronic calorie restriction will only further worsen your thyroid function, increase reverse T3 levels. So even though you're taking T4, 
It might just be turning into reverse T3 and really just acting against you to slow down that metabolism. So it's important that you are strict. And like I said in the beginning, remember, you probably not going to be somebody that you can go out and have um, cakes and things like that as often as your friends who have a functioning thyroid. So you really need to be strict. But I don't want you to say, I don't want you to just eat less than 1,200 to 1,300 calories per day every single day. Okay, that, that's not sustainable long term. Instead, what you have to do is if you fall into that category and you're like, okay, well, that's me. And what do I do if, if I eat? If I eat um, more than 1,200 calories, I can start gaining weight. You're going to have to focus on healing your metabolism, and we'll have to we'll have to talk about that in a different video altogether because that's a whole whole other uh, topic here. But basically, if you fall into that category, just know that you there are only a handful of ways that you can heal your metabolism, and you need to be focusing on that. So, what does it mean though for those um, who are who are just curious about this? What what does that mean? Basically, I want you to stick to organic food groups and grass-fed meats. I want you to not be scared of eating healthy fats either. So don't just avoid fats because you think they're going to make you fat. That's, that's not the truth. You need to eat tons of, tons of vegetables. I do not want you to be snacking every two to three hours. Okay, that, That's going to work, to get, work against you by increasing your insulin levels. So it's better to have um, larger meals less frequently. Obviously, you need to be avoiding processed foods or anything that comes in a box or package. That should go without saying. And then avoid, art, avoid uh, sugar, artificial sweeteners as much as possible. Sugar any added sugar should just be kind of off the menu. Um, artificial sweeteners are probably okay in moderation. Uh, specifically, I'm talking about like stevia. Um, I, I wouldn't want you to, to consume the sugar alcohols. But in general, in some patients, if they're overweight and have insulin resistance, through the incretin effect, that can make things a little bit worse. So just remember that um, if you're dealing with insulin resistance as well, I would still recommend you avoid both sugar and artificial sweeteners as well. Okay. Um, and then number five is when you have enough energy, then I do want you to exercise. And specifically, I want to make it, I want, I want you to make it count, okay? So what that means is this. I know that a lot of post-thyroidectomy patients deal with fatigue um, because that's one of the presenting symptoms that they come to me with. So it can be difficult to say, okay, well, if you just exercise more, then you'll lose weight. Man, eh, it's not quite that easy. Obviously, if you're you know, your energy level is a three or four out of 10, it's going to be difficult to get up to do that exercise. Now, that's where this whole treating your thyroid with the right type of medication comes into play. Because even though, as I mentioned, getting on the right sort of thyroid medication may not uh, drastically cause you to lose weight, it will most likely increase your energy levels and allow you to be more active, allow you to get up and do sort of the low intensity and a combination of high intensity throughout the day. So you, this, they all kind of come together, right? It's not like you can really do one of these things without the other. So don't, don't do that. If you, if you want to follow this advice, I'd recommend you follow as much of it as possible. So make sure that when you get that increase in energy, this is what you want to be doing. So number one, you need to be staying active with low intensity exercise all the time, every single day. Okay. So that means generally what I'll say is at minimum 30 minutes of walking every single day or cumulatively about an hour per day. So if you have a desk job, that means getting up every hour for, you know, five to 10 minutes to walk around or something like that, walk for lunch, and when you get home, walk, just stay active constantly throughout the day. Now, the next thing is you wanna make sure, so that's that's being done every single day, then the next thing is you wanna make sure you are doing high intensity interval training. So that can be just 10 to 20 minutes, one to three times per week. You don't have to go spend an hour at the gym doing high intensity work. You can still get the maximum benefit by just doing that um, only a handful of times per week. So, and I've given you a video here to kind of discuss super slow workout, which. Um, doesn't work for every uh, post-thyroidectomy patient, but I do find a lot of benefit, especially if you have uh, insulin resistance because it can help sensitize the body to insulin um, in addition to providing increase in muscle mass. Okay, so that's, that's basically the way you want to be looking at um, weight loss if you're post-thyroidectomy. Um, you really need to be doing as many of these, these things as possible. The last little advice that I would give you is you, if you are post-thyroidectomy, you kind of fall into... Um, what I would describe as a special sort of subcategory of, of patients with hypothyroidism. Okay, so you, even though a lot of the, the information regarding hypothyroidism in general applies to you, there are some, some, some nuances to the treatment of a post-thyroidectomy and post-RAI patient. So just remember that um, it, it means that basically your hormones become even more important than they do for some other people. It also means that you're not going to be able to be as strict as somebody else who who has a even somewhat functioning thyroid. Okay. So I hope this was educational. I hope this was helpful for you guys. Of course, if you have any questions about um, how, how I came up with this information or, or the studies or anything like that, please feel free to let me know. And just, just so you guys know, I have helped 
successfully post-thyroidectomy patients lose weight. It's, it's not impossible if you fall into this category. It, yes, it's more difficult, but it certainly is possible. It just takes a little bit longer and it's a little more slowly. Um, and it, it's, it's funny because even a lot of the patients who come in to see me, they're, they're happy with just five pounds of weight loss. And oftentimes we can do significantly more than that. So um, anyway, just want to know to give you that hope that it is possible. It just takes this right approach. So uh, anyways, thanks for joining me, guys.